Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I really appreciate NUM Focus for putting this fantastic conference together, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Memex. Um, just to get started, um, as she said, I'm Katrina Real. I'm the co-principal investigator for the Continuum team working on the Memex project under DARPA. We're actually on two different teams on this project. So we actually work with, uh, with NASA JPL kitware. So we have one team there, and then we also work with NYU on another team. So we actually have two different teams that we work with on this, on this project. And I'm gonna talk about the work that we do with both of them. So the first thing I wanted to start with is when you ask the internet a question, who do you think is answering you, right? <laughs> In most cases, all of us are going to a commercial search engine. We go through and we take our keywords and we type them into the computer. And we have some business in the background that has gone out and done all this search for us, created indexes, and giving us back results that are highly filtered, right? They are giving us what they, their view of the internet is. So many people don't seem to realize that there is just a surface of the web that we're actually getting views into. When we do a, a search with a commercial search engine, all we're seeing is that surface web. Underneath what is visible through commercial and normal search methods is this whole other layer of the internet that right now is very difficult to see. You have to know exactly where you're going to. You have to understand more about the internet and more about how to get to these places in order to grab that kind of content. So what am I talking about here? So we're really talking about only 15% of the internet is actually visible. People may not realize that. Um, beneath that, in the deep web, there's actually the largest growing portion of content on the internet right now. And this includes dynamic content, multimedia content, things that are not traditionally text content. And um, we're trying to get to that sort of of material out on the internet and make it readily available and accessible. And I also want to make the distinction between the deep web and the dark web. So some people have probably heard of the dark web. This is where a lot of um, people, you have to use Tor sites, Onion sites, things like that. You have to use a Tor browser in order to go into that part of the, of the internet where it's very much anonymized in order to, in order to um, get to that kind of um, material. I'm going to focus mostly on the deep web. So this is using just regular, um, most, you know, your normal internet protocols where we're talking about information that's publicly available on the deep web. It's just below the surface. What makes it special is the visibility. It's not readily available to us. So I want to talk a little bit about the DARPA MEMEX program. I started in September 2014, and we're talking, and we have about 17 teams from all over the country that are all working on this problem. What we're doing is we're trying to find a different way to look at the web and be able to conduct searches on the web. And in some ways, we're actually trying to democratize search. Um, when DARPA was looking at the, at the internet, they saw this one-size-fits-all approach where people were searching the internet in much the same way and not really having any sort of novel approaches, right? We're looking at companies that are really based on advertising. They're trying to sell us things. They're filtering the results that they're giving back to us based on the ability to sell us things. <laughs> and so they wanted to create all of these tools that are available on an, in an open source platform for us to be able to search the internet better. And so why does this matter for, you know, why is the government interested in this, right? Um, well, because there are a lot of search parameters that are not, they're not normal, right? We're looking at um, things that nefarious activities that may be taking place on the internet, things like um, human trafficking, looking at um, illicit pharmaceuticals being sold. But more importantly, I think by making these tools open source to everyone, what they're allowing people to do is conduct their own sort of searches. As I mentioned before, there's a huge and rich amount of information available in the deep web. So for businesses, you can imagine that this might be a really good place to mine information about other businesses you're considering doing business with. Forum data, being able to actually look at you know, presentations by people who have actually worked at that company and find more information about them. Or in an investment opportunity, maybe you want to do a very thorough search in that entire area <laughs> and um, get a better lay of the land and where investment opportunities may lie. 
So in the Memex program, we're really taking you know, several different disciplines and putting them all together. We're looking at high performance computing, information retrieval, um, machine learning, and, um, and then just traditional you know, web scraping technologies and indexing. All, all in the same area. So this collaboration is happening across all the different teams. And so I just wanted to really talk about like the reason that they've gotten into this area is primarily because of Silk Road. Um, this is actually something that took place on the dark web. So this isn't in the deep web. But on the dark web, the, there was a site being run, Silk Road, where illegal drugs were being sold, there were allegations of murder for hire, all sorts of things that were happening on this, um, in this area that were not readily visible to others. So this program kind of came out of that, out of that um, 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 use case. We actually are working on several different domains. All the teams are working on all of these domains. So we're applying these, um, these technologies into human labor trafficking child exploitation, uh, weapons, so tracking um, illegally sold firearms all across the internet, um, illicit pharmaceuticals, I'm sure all of you have received you know, spam emails you know, guaranteeing you drugs from whatever, <laughs> um, materials research science and autonomous systems research, both of these are kind of interesting because they're both domains where we're actually trying to index PDF documents or um, scientific data that is out there, so published results from or proceedings from conferences that are not readily available and give search tools on top of those to give you know, more information about the content inside of those different domains. And then also financial fraud and counterfeit electronics. Counterfeit electronics I think is really interesting because in this case we're actually doing a lot of image processing. We also are in human labor trafficking as well where we're actually able to take images pull out information and index based on location, pull out to, um, information about the background, who's involved in the picture, track where they're going, how, and see movements as they move across the internet, whether or not the, inter the picture is showing up in different places with different organizations, things like that. In counterfeit electronics, we're really also trying to find mostly electronics that are entering the supply chain for um, the military forces. That, are, that may have sabotage or backdoor capabilities built into them. So we're looking for things that have had some sort of tampering involved there and comparing images to see whether or not they're actually receiving the electronics that were actually ordered. As I mentioned before, I just want to stress all of this is open source. You can go to opencatalog.darpa.mil and click on the Memex program and all of the teams have their open source software available there. Um, also, you know, I just want to mention our team here at Continuum, um, everything's built on the Anaconda platform, so we actually have Conda packages for most of the things that we work on. So you can actually Conda install um, several of the things I'm going to talk about here. So before we actually kind of dive into the tools that we've been building, I just want to talk a little bit about the ecosystem for building a system like this. Like, what sort of pieces are we looking at when we want to architect a system that does this, right? As I mentioned before, we're taking all of these different areas and kind of pushing them together. And we want to pick the best technologies and make them work well together. Um, I know that I've run into this situation where I've looked at a lot of open source projects and I thought, wow, that is really cool capability. <laughs> now, how do I actually use it in a larger context? How do I make it talk to this other system? How do I put these two together, right? So. Um, here, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. And so we're looking at you know, basic business intelligence database technologies. Probably everyone is familiar, you know, MongoDB, MySQL, all of these different backends for um, storing data. Um, in the data mining, machine learning stats area, we have you know, uh, NIME and R, Scikit-Learn, Weka, Pandas, all of these different areas. Scientific computing, I just think most people are here definitely familiar with, um, working with SciPy, NumPy, uh, Numba goes into this area, um, as well as Pi tables, things like that. And in the distributed system, we have Hadoop, Impala, Hive, Spark, and then we have a bunch of different things that cross over between different areas. So for example, I just wanted to mention you know, Mahout and uh, our Hadoop as well, because these have machine learning capabilities built into them. And also um, Spark ML is another one that I wanted to mention is also available. Um, so we have all of these different, we have this huge landscape of tools 
that we want to be able to look at and put together into a system and make it actually function in a in a, a um, in an easy way. We want people to be able to do this easily and put the the power of search back into people's hands. Um, how are we going to take all of these different things, put it into a platform that makes sense without making ourselves insane, <laughs> and also distribute it? Um, so. I just want to talk a little bit about the analytics pipeline, and we'll talk a more about the tools in a minute. Um, so this is actually a very normal pipeline that we're talking about. We send out crawlers just like every other commercial search engine does out there. We go out and like crawl different areas, seed it, and, and crawl and scrape different things. We're going to extract entities from that content that we've pulled. We're going to index that. And then on top of that, we want to build applications and tools and different analytics on top of that in order to tell what kind of contact we've, content we've actually run into. Um, the thing I want to also mention here, as I said before, though, what makes this special is that we're going to areas of the internet where we might be looking at con dynamic content, where we might be looking at multimedia content, where we might be actually um, indexing images or uh, audio files or something like that. So it's not, we're, we're, we're augmenting it slightly. We're also talking about a much larger area. Right? We're, we're, he we're trying to get to an area that is much, much larger than the 15% of the internet that we actually see. And then we also want to create search tools that look at the data in a novel way. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I never click on to the second page after I do a search, right? Um, but it would be nice to have some sort of characterization of what other information may be in that area for me to expand my search or for me to be able to find things that I didn't know even existed, or even suggest trending areas in that domain that I might want to look at. So, enter Memex Explorer. So, this is, idea here is to create a pluggable framework <coughs> where people are able to run their own searches. Um, you can seed Memex Explorer any way you want. It's a Django app web application. Um, you can, um, we're currently even working on putting a cluster behind it so that you might be able to even scale it out and index much larger amounts of data. Um, we basically take everything that we run into and we're going to throw it into an Elasticsearch index. And then on top of that, we're going to create visualizations or different dashboards in order to look at the content that we're, we're, we're talking about here. And this kind of gets back to the, to the work that we've been doing with our different partners. So NASA JPL are, are very involved in the Apache community. So we have the Apache Nutch crawler on one side. And then we also have the NYU Aceh crawler available as well. So we have these two different crawlers um, that are both accessible through Memex Explorer. And um, the nice thing about both of these is that you can do directed crawling. So we can actually train um, different models. Um, and upload them into the crawler and determine relevance. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But mostly we've been using Naive Bayes um, models in order to determine relevance. And that will help us determine, direct the crawl into areas that are interesting to us. But, um, and more importantly there, it also kind of helps cull down the data <laughs> and make it, makes it a much more uh, uh, focused data set. And then another thing I wanted to mention as well is NYU's domain discovery tool, which is a very, um, it actually uses a commercial search engine in order to seed a, a search, goes out and finds information about that area, and then you can label different pages as relevant or irrelevant and spit out a model. So from there, it's actually going to use Weka to train a machine learning model, use that, you can upload it into Aceh, and at that point you can do your directed crawling. Um, and I also wanted to mention, we have done a couple of collaborations. As I mentioned before, this is on the Anaconda platform. We've really tried to keep this very modular. So the idea being that you have this whole suite of tools that you'd be able to pick and choose are most appropriate to your domain, and then be able to customize it for the particular search that you're trying to create. So um, with Carnegie Mellon University, they created a time anomaly detection tool was mostly, you know, obviously for financial data or things that have time series data available in them in order to find uh, anomalies in there. And then and it also uses uh, bouquet dashboards and things like that in order to visualize results. And then also we have a Sotera data weight plugin. This is a new collaboration that we've been working on where they actually have a Firefox plugin that will follow the movements of a subject matter expert as they do an investigation on the internet and kind of follows them. 
It collects metadata about what they're looking at, um, URLs that they're visiting, information about what they're actually seeing. But then we can take the results from that trail of investigation, import it into Memex Explorer. We can possibly even edit the seed list and then use it to, in order to expand the search out into, an, into areas that they may not have actually seen before or that might be interesting to them. So I mentioned before with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, they're working on NUT, which is, a, um, as you see, a highly extensible, highly scalable web crawler. The nice thing about NUT is that it does have a, a politeness factor in, um, inherent to it. So it's not going to overload servers. It's a little bit, um, you're not as likely to get blocked, <laughs> I'll put it that way, as you're trying to crawl different sites. Um, and then also Apache Tika, and I can't say enough about Apache Tika. I think that this is a fantastic tool. This is our first round of extraction where we're using Tika to pull content out of what we're looking at. And this, this also does rich content types. So you can use PDF, you can look at PowerPoints, you can use all sorts of different things, things that are not normally um, even, uh, even indexed in the, in the regular internet. And so, and the other nice thing, I also just want to mention, um, working on uh, automatic translation services um, and uh, different multimedia types are also being worked into Tika right now. Um, I also want to mention, especially since we are at PyData, that we do have Python front ends to both of these. So there's a Nutch Python that's available and a Tika Python available. Both of them have RESTful services available for you to basically query and use the services to, um, to look at content. And also uh, talking about NYU's work on Ache um, and the domain discovery tool. As I mentioned before, both of these are freely available out on, on GitHub and they're available through the open catalog um, through DARPA. So this is a, um, as I mentioned before, this is a joint, um, this is a cooperative effort on all of our sides. All, everyone's you know, participating in this one. So NYU and, and JPL both have um, have contributed to Memex Explorer. And the idea here, as I mentioned before, is for it to, to create an application specifically tailored to your domain. And uh, here in the screenshot, you can actually see um, we're using Bokeh to give you crawl statistics as you're actually moving through data. Here, this is actually an Ache crawl, so we have a, a, a naive-based classifier working as we're, as we're crawling. And you can kind of see where the domains are being crawled over here and then the harvest plot, what are we finding that is relevant? So we're not crawling beyond things that we find ir that are irrelevant. We're not going to waste our time moving down into the depths of an area that doesn't look interesting to us. We're able to, to get that feedback as we're moving through the crawl and, and, and um, move into areas that are interesting. As I mentioned before, this is on top of the Anaconda platform. Uh, we do have a Memex channel, as I mentioned before, so we have Conda packages for almost everything. And another thing that's kind of interesting about this, I just want to mention that um, uh, we have, you know, since you, you can package pretty much anything that's, that's an executable. So we've had Conda packages where we actually deploy Docker um, containers. We've had Conda packages where we deploy uh, Java programs. We've, uh, we've packaged a lot of things. So we've used R, we've used Java, we've used C, C++, we've used pretty much everything you can imagine we've packaged in some sort of Conda package and made available. Um, which is, I mean, just an incredibly powerful platform to use. I also wanted to, um, Travis said quite a bit about Blaze, so I'm gonna skip some of this, but we do use Blaze to sort of provide that um, the uh, uniform API that we're looking for. As you can imagine, we have a lot of data coming in that we want to be able to compare. So, for example, if you look at something like, um, I'm, I've been doing investigations in, uh, in financial fraud, so I'm gonna use that as an example. <laughs> but, um, so we might have company information coming in, as well as blue sheet information coming in. We may have uh, ticker data coming in. And then also, we have sentiment analysis that we want to do out on the, on the internet or in different forums that we've actually directed our crawl to. And then we want to be able to actually take all of these different um, data sources and pull them all together in some way that makes sense. And we use Blaze in order to do that. Um, as I'll skip this part. I also wanted to talk a little bit about Bokeh. Um, 
so uh, this is, provides the interactive visualizations that, you're t that you saw before. So I was just showing you a screenshot using the Ache crawler where we're actually getting feedback from the crawler as it's, as it's crawling. And then we provide, we actually get bouquet visualizations built on the fly from those results and, um, and display them as it's, as it's crawling. Also wanted to mention scikit-learn. We use this extensively in order to do a lot of modeling. Um, we, we're mostly working with unstructured data, so we're trying, we use quite a bit of clustering in order to look at what is out there and characterize what we're seeing. We also use quite a bit of classification. If we're able to actually propagate labels that like denoting relevance, for example, um, then we'll, we'll frame it more as a classification problem. Um, before I move on, I just want to do a quick demo. So here's Memex Explorer up and working. The idea here is that if we wanted to create a new project, these would coincide with the different domains that I mentioned before. So if maybe you wanted to start an investigation in human trafficking or you wanted to create a, a domain for uh, material research science or something like that. In this case, I created a project called TEST, which is actually um, focused on financial fraud. So what I've done here is um, you can, when I move here to seeds, you can see the different trails where I've actually had my subject matter expert use the plugin in Firefox, create different trails that give me information about where an investigator might look for information when they're investigating in this area. So this is not displaying correctly on Safari, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> but, um, um, but the idea here is that we can take this trail, edit it, create a seed list, and then when we move over to Memex Explorer, I come into test, if I want to start a new crawl, I can actually pick up that seed list. So that seed list that I would have created from the, from the um, data wake trail, I can create it here, give all the parameters for my different crawl, I can put some metadata associated with it, specify which which crawler I want to use, and then how many rounds deep I want to go. So how far do I want this to fan out? You could set it really, really high, um, right? It, or as you're tuning it, you might want to set it a little bit lower just to make sure that your classifier is working correctly and that you're getting information that makes sense to you. Um, once you set the crawl working, I'm actually going to show you the other screenshot I showed you was from an Ache crawl. Um, this is actually from a Nutch crawl here. The nice thing here is we actually have this crawl monitor so you can start and stop your crawls up here. You can see how many rounds left you have. And then you can see as it's moving through all of these different sites um, how long it's taking. And this kind of gives you an idea. You can see how the crawler is actually performing, which is interesting. I find it interesting, especially because we do find some sites where you might get stuck, where things might not quite work the way you think that they might. Or you may end up running into some content that we don't normally handled just yet, especially as we're handling dynamic content. That is probably the most challenging um, part of, of crawling in this domain. <laughs> um, once we've actually done the crawl, um, I just wanted to show you, we have these uh, Kibana dashboards. As I mentioned before, we're, we're uh, using Elasticsearch on the back end. So all of the information is running through Tika. We're doing our initial extraction using Tika. It's moving into Elasticsearch. And from Elasticsearch, I'm able to actually create these dashboards on the fly using Kibana, which is also freely available. Um, this is not a very compelling visualization right here, but very quickly you can see that you know, I took content from the internet. I, I crawled 421 pages. And I was able to see content and then get an idea of what my term frequency is just that easily. And they have these nice dialogues for creating the visualization. So it's very, very, very easy to put these together. Um, ultimately, we want to, as we're, we're building up our, our, our visualization toolkit, we're going to move to uh, bouquet dashboards for everything. So right now, we're only visualizing sort of crawl statistics as we're moving through the crawl with, with bouquet. But ultimately, we want to be able to move all of these dashboards into an interactive setting. Because right there, here, there is some interaction, so you can see data as you're moving through it. But you, don't, you can't necessarily interact with the data, select portions of the data, drill down into the data, things like that. 
And I also mentioned uh, the uh, New York University's uh, um, domain discovery tool. I just wanted to really quickly show you this one. Um, I actually pre-populated this one with, uh, I created a crawler called SEC. And then um, for the web search, I used words like penny stock, guaranteed results, big money, you know, things like that. Um, things that you might find with somebody who's trying to lure somebody into a pump and dump scheme, right? So these all represent sites. And then we have terms over on the side that kind of tell you where they came from. As you move over them, you can kind of get an idea of what the context is that that term is coming from. The cool thing here is that then, you know, you may want to look at different ways that these are clustering. Right here, we're just using a, C a PCA, so principal component analysis, in order to look and see what, we're, um, what kind of clusters we're looking at here. But then I can actually, I'll select some. And then, as I come down here, I can see a preview of what has actually been picked up from that website. And then I can start tagging relevant or irrelevant, right? And put in, let's say this one's neutral, things like that. So as I move down here or up here, if you want to tag them all at the same time, and so my blue dots are now tagged as relevant. My red dots are now irrelevant. And then over here on this side, um, come on. In theory, you should be able to see how many relevant and irrelevant terms are showing up on this side. <laughs> um, but. Um, so once we have all of our tags created, though, so we've seeded this search, we've gone out, we pulled content, we now have all these significant terms. We're just using these, the words. We're not doing any kind of stemming or any kind of bigrams or trigrams or anything like that. Just using words as features, we can go ahead and actually train a model. So just by clicking on this model button up at the top, we're going to call to Weka, we're going to use our features, and we're going to train a naive Bayes model, which then gets spit out, which we can use in our crawl, upload into Memex Explorer, and then use as a crawl. Um, I just also wanted to mention real quick some of the other um, capabilities we have in here. Um, If you do already have a collection of documents that you've pulled together, or you've been collecting PDFs on something forever, or something like that, um, you can actually just use the add new data set and upload it to the site yourself. It'll automatically run everything through Tika and index it just like the rest of the, of the workflow works. So you have access to all of the visualizations without actually having to run the crawler. Okay. So moving back over here. So now we've collected all this data. You can see that we've pulled in some crawl statistics. We have all this content. We have a bunch of unstructured data that we can look at in very rough sort of ways and tag as being relevant or irrelevant. We can train models and things like that. But when we pull a large amount of data back, what, how are we going to characterize what's in it? So let's say that we've got terabytes of data coming back to us, not just something where we're looking at 421 <laughs> documents right? in this small crawl that I, I did here. Um, this is actually, we, so we're using topic modeling as a first pass. Um, the idea here, this is actually a, a, a it's, um, we have a topic library that's actually uh, started by Christine Doig over here. And um, <laughs> the idea here is that it's a, basically an uns, uh, unsupervised clustering algorithm where you're able to find topics. So if you think of each word as being, having the probability of contributing to a topic, that's what we're really looking at. So it's not really a document that's going to contribute to the, docu to, to the topic. We're going to talk about the words themselves. So the words will organize into these different clusters where we can actually look and see what sort of topics are coming out in this unstructured way. One way to visualize this, you can see that obviously this is a, a bouquet plot as well. We're looking at termite plots here. Um, one problem with, uh, with the uh, topic modeling is that we actually do have to specify the number of clusters that we're going to create. So if you think of the x-axis as the number of clusters, each cluster number, you're seeing a, uh, 
what words contributed mo to that particular cluster. So we don't have yet a way to name the topics, but we can get an idea of what's in them. So for example, in this one, I think this one is actually showing, um, oh, this is material sciences. So you can see different trending topics in material sciences. So um, what's, what's hot in there? It was interesting when we did this on autonomy domain, actually, we were able to see things like drone literature kind of picked up. We were able to see um, trends where neural networks became less popular and we were able to see more drone technology showing up in the literature. And, um, and especially, it, and you could see all of these things just kind of clustering and, clo and, and moving together, which was very interesting. And then also we have the LDA viz available here. Um, the nice thing here, um, I wish I had a, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a, a live um, demo of this, but you can see all the different clusters created here on the left-hand side. As you mouse over them, they light up red, and then you can see sort of the overlap of how the words in that particular topic compare to others. So it's just comparing it to the rest of the content that you've pulled. And then, as I mentioned before, we're using Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, you saw the Kibana dashboard. It wasn't, a, like I said, it was not a very compelling demonstration of, of our um, of Kibana dashboards. But this one is a little bit more interesting, where you can see that it's automatically discretized our time series. So this is looking at trending terms on calls that have been done over time. So we can pull in data and see how things have changed. So even if you, especially as you're looking at dynamic content, you may find that you have very, very different information coming to you. Some parts of the internet are changing very, very rapidly. Or as you can imagine, some of the more, um, uh, how should I put it? Uh, I, some of the domains that we look at are very ephemeral. People are trying to hide their identities. <laughs> They're trying to make it very um, difficult to track movements. So we can see how things have changed over time, and we can identify areas where we may want to crawl more often in order to be able to grab content. Um, so I think that's pretty pretty cool visualization. Um, I kind of flew through this pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, happy to answer any questions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the question was whether or not we're using any graph databases or graph technologies. Not currently. Um, that's actually something that we're very interested in using. I know that Dato um, open sourced some of their graph technologies recently, and we've been looking at trying to incorporate that into this because I think it's very applicable to this domain. Yes? I'm sorry. Right now, we're just using Elasticsearch. Um, we do use some other databases just for keeping metadata as we're crawling and things like that, um, but primarily Elasticsearch. Um, on the image processing, we're using Solar, so, but also Lucene-based. So um, we, we kind of move between those two, Solar and Elasticsearch. Yes, back here. You, yes, yeah, you. <laughs> Uh-huh. Right, that's actually an open research topic for us. Um, Creating a name for a topic is extraordinarily hard. Um, there are a couple different things we've actually been trying to do with the with the topic modeling, um, and I just and I, I also wanted to mention that we've been uh, so we do have two different algorithms in, implemented. We're using the um, PLSA, so the probabilistic latent semantic analysis, and then we're also using LDA, the latent derelict um, analysis. And so, and then we have two different backends for this. So we are using the ability to run on just a single machine, 
And then we also have the ability to actually, um, using Anaconda cluster, um, move to a much larger um, back end. So what's nice here is we're able to um, kind of configure it depending on how we assume how big the domain is going to be, right? But every experiment that I've done trying to seed clusters, <laughs> everything that I've done trying to direct clusters or try to manipulate it in any sort of way, usually ends up in a big mess. I actually end up with huge um, kind of dribbly clusters that end up all over the place and don't really give you any information at all. Or I end up with something that, um, you know, it, it just really doesn't characterize well. But um, as far as actually coming up with a, a keyword term or something that will actually describe that, right now we're just using frequency in order to determine what's actually up there. Um, and, you know, that seems to be working well enough for now. <laughs> yeah. Over here. Right. Since we're not looking at text, right? We're so we do have some uh, Selenium solutions where we're actually clicking around and trying to get JavaScript um, to return, and then we can actually look at the JavaScript, right? But that in that case, we end up basically with a headless browser which is kind of a strange situation to be in, right? We would like to be able to create a situation where we can interact with a database or act, interact with a, with a website and get smart content back without actually having to move to that level. Um, so we're, we are looking for solutions that go beyond the sort of headless uh, browser situation. Um, so. It, but yeah, as you click around, as you put information into forms, as you, you know, um, put input into the system, being able to get content back that you can then characterize is very, very difficult. No, we're actually trying to create smart ways um, to uh, talk to the different sites. So. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have seen the Google tools that will answer your email for you, <laughs> right? So <laughs> it trains itself on your own emails and then it'll create a, an email from you <laughs> automatically <laughs> for people, right? Um, the idea there, right, is that we want to be able to train something to interact with the website in an intelligent fashion and be able to actually pull content out in a way that makes sense. We don't just want to try every single permutation and see where it crashes. Right, so <laughs> we'd rather actually have something that worked well. But also open research, <laughs> maybe year two. <laughs> yes? Uh, the same yes, um, I actually, um, I'm not doing a local in, um, demo today. I actually was using our server, but I, I do have this up and running on my local machine, no problem. Yes. Yeah, actually that is an interesting thing to talk about. So privacy issues are something that we all take pretty seriously, right? We are looking for, this is all publicly available information. We're not trying to break into sites and pull anything out that it would be considered illegal or anything like that. We're only looking for content that is freely available out on the internet, right? But, um, we, yeah, just as a rule, we're basically trying to preserve that sort of um, privacy. <laughs> but there is nothing formalized in that way, right? So, <laughs> but we're not trying to get into, you know, medical records or any sort of, you know, insurance information or things like that, right? It's just, we're pointing it at, at areas where people are, you know, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, <laughs> um, those areas right there. Yes. That's actually something we just put in a proposal for. <laughs> so um, being able to actually uh, estimate the size of a domain is very difficult, right? I mean, because these are not traditionally indexed areas of the web. And if you think about it, you know, the web can be, especially if you're looking at dynamic content, that can be infinite, right? That could go all over the place. 
And um, so, uh, but we have been kind of discussing different metrics to determine completeness, especially as we're doing directed crawling. I think that we'll be able to use something along the lines of like a semi-supervised um, situation where we actually are able to cluster, propagate labels, and then crawl and then feed it back in order to determine a steady state. At that point, I think we can safely say that we've exhausted that particular area, um, but we're not totally sure yet. It's open research. <laughs> Yes. Uh, are you positioning the results of the analysis, um, like open data? Like how are you publishing? We're, uh, so the different teams are publishing on the tools that they're developing so, and the technologies and techniques that they're, they're actually creating. The data that's actually pulled from this, this project that's being delivered to the different law enforcement agencies is theirs. They're actually opening active investigations and using it in order to, um, to prosecute. So um, no data is coming out of it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.